Greetings, everyone. I'm so excited to be with you all today and share with you what it personally means for to me to be part of City of Hope and the City of Hope family. Uh, my name is Dan Kotecki. I'm the System Vice President of New Patient Access for City of Hope. And in this role, I have the distinct pleasure of leading the group of mission-driven and dedicated team members who answer that first call from a prospective new patient, take the time to understand their current situation, help them get scheduled at one of our many care locations across the country, and of course, prepare them for that visit. I also have the honor of leading our Unparalleled Cancer Fighters organization in partnership with Jen Mike's an incredible organization that is focused on making sure no one has to walk their cancer journey alone. I've been part of City of Hope for 12 years, initially joining at our City of Hope Chicago location, which at the time was known as Cancer Treatment Centers of America. I joined the team shortly after the passing of my mother-in-law from lung cancer. And within a year of joining the organization, my life was unexpectedly touched again by cancer when my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer in the fall of 2012. About a year after that, my mom was diagnosed with uterine cancer. Both of my parents elected to seek treatment at City of Hope Chicago. And due to the incredible work of the doctors and care teams around them, both are now cancer survivors. In fact, they are not only cancer survivors, but also active members of the cancer fighter community now committed to supporting and inspiring others who may be facing similar diagnoses and circumstances. In my role at City of Hope, I take tremendous pride and consider it a great honor to be able to lead the very contact center that was there as a beacon of hope for my parents over a decade ago and ensure it continues to burn bright for the many others across the nation who are looking for deeply personalized cancer care. I am so looking forward to our time together this morning. And now let me turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Vijay Trasal, City of Hope's Chief Medical Officer, who will share with you a bit about City of Hope's deep history and its mission. Thank you, Dan. That was an incredible story. Um, the work that you have done, in fact, even before City of Hope uh, became, took over Chicago, Phoenix, and Atlanta, I would see a lot of these uh, advertisements on TV and how warmly the the system would uh, both encourage and embrace new patients. And I know uh, your fingerprints are all over there. So uh, thank you. Thank you for bringing that expertise to the City of Hope uh, of the future. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as Dan mentioned, my role uh, as, as I am privileged to hold the title of the Chief Medical Officer. And in my role, a lot of what I do is oversee the quality of care that we deliver across the whole enterprise, the safety for patients, the patient experience part of it. But I also have a role in making sure that our education, our graduate medical education becomes integrated into the whole system and that we have this electronic health record that brings out the best way of taking care of our patients, but also collects that information so that we can collate that and query that and bring out the, the next iteration of how we can make it easier on our doctors, our nurses, our patients to be able to deliver that care. So I'm delighted today to talk briefly about what City of Hope means, what it started with, and where we uh, have a responsibility of bringing future cures to the patients that have that disease today. Can we go to the slides, Jen? I would love to um, have some point of reference. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I can tell you that I have been at many organizations. I did my training in India, then in Michigan. I uh, was in a PhD program, then did my residency there. I've been at Duarte now for 22 years, mainly as a trainee initially, and then I was focused on research, helped build our network in the community, and then came back as this role as the chief medical officer. And I have seen many mission statements. Even this mission statement that is in front of you, that 
talks about transforming the future and bringing science into practical benefit. If you asked me without reading it, I would not remember it. But what I do remember and what is the core of the mission of City, City of Hope is what you see on that picture. And this picture is the Golter Gate. It is Sam Golter, who was the first president of City of Hope. This was his philosophy, and this was what has continued in the veins of City of Hope. This Golter Gate, which talks about what is it that we do, and that there is no profit in curing the body if in the process we destroy the soul. This is I know that when I take our future City of Hope family members to come and they walk through the Rose Garden and this gate is in the middle of that, that this attracts them and this is what binds us all together. How we got here and where we are is a 110-year-old history. Let me go back to the next slide that talks about where we are today. So Dan will talk briefly about our national system. In Southern California, we have now 35 sites that are all like a nursery. Some of them are mature sites where we take care of everything. And some of them are smaller sites where we may only do infusion or only have urology taking care of patients with GU cancers. Even eight years back, we just had a smaller group of people. 10 years back, we were only about 3,000 employees. And we have expanded and we're now about 11,000 employees that take care of more than 130 unique, 130,000 unique new patients every year. Uh, we have grown to about 600 doctors and a lot more of the ancillary staff of advanced practice providers and multiple clinical trials. So when we talk about NCC and National Comprehensive Cancer Network, you might have heard that word bandied around. City of Hope was a founding member of that. So about 50 years back when we developed the protocols and the algorithms of how cancer should be treated, not just in America, but across the whole country, City of Hope is on each and every disease team. In fact, our ideas and our algorithms that we develop at City of Hope is incorporated into the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. We have been on US World News Report on the top 10 in, in the last two years. And before that, have always been in the top 20 of US World News Report. And that is not just based on um, what our reputation is, not just based on the number of patients we see, not just based on patient experience, not just based on the magnet status that we have. It's not just based on the accolades that we get from patients, but fundamentally how we contribute to the community from how our research is able to change the lives of those people that may never have heard of City of Hope. We've also had when we look back at the data that we talked about, we've had exceptional outcomes. In fact, there are times when our outcomes of survival are 20 points different than many other well-known institutions. And that puts to us the responsibility of making sure that we are able to widen our network, the way we're able to take this exceptional care and we're able to deliver it at places where we may not be the ones delivering this, where it may be other people that are there. I'll hand you to Dan at this point, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about how we got here, how we got from two tents to a place that is taking care of and will be taking care of more than 200,000 unique patients at least every year. Thank you, BJ. You know, when I think about the mission of City of Hope, I get energized by the opportunity of um, taking that high quality, compassionate and personalized care we have all experienced um, and combining it with the clinical expertise and cutting edge research that City of Hope is renowned for and packaging all that up in, into a, a, a uh, uh, just a tremendous and incredible um, opportunity to, to touch even more patients um, who are who are living with cancer? 
Uh, I'm more confident than ever that we're going to continue to deliver on tomorrow's cures um, to patients today. We're going to do that um, through our nationally integrated system, uh, VJ, that you mentioned with our campuses in Los Angeles, California, Orange County, California, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Chicago, Illinois, and uh, Atlanta, Georgia. We also have a growing network of uh, more than 30 care locations around these campuses, demonstrating our commitment to bringing City of Hope's high quality cancer care even closer to home for many more patients. Dr. Trissal, perhaps you can touch a bit more on City of Hope's 110 year legacy of pioneering medical breakthroughs. Absolutely, Dan. You know, uh, looking at that slide that, that is up right now, what I am amazed by is that there are 80 plus million people in this country that are within driving distance of one of these sites. So the impact we can have uh, is immense and getting this care closer to where people live is our responsibility as well. Next slide, please. So how did it all start? And I, I can tell you, I was not here at this time, but I feel like I'm old enough to know this uh, and feel it and touch it because this happened right over there. If I look through the window here, this is the site where when tuberculosis was a scourge, when in the early 1900s, people were dying of tuberculosis, there was not a cure, there was not a treatment. People with tuberculosis would come from across the country and sometimes even from outside the country to come to sunny California. There was better air here at that time and there was more sun and warmth it was thought to help cure tuberculosis. And many of those patients would be shunned from the city and thrown at the foothills. So this is the foothills of the St. Gabriel Valley and they would be pushed out here. This was the end of Los Angeles, end of civilization here in Southern California. And they would unfortunately die here. And there is this story that Sam Golder talks about, about this young boy who was barely 20 years old coming from Boston, Massachusetts, and coming here. And with tuberculosis, you have sometimes these cavitary lesions. You have these bugs that can erode into an artery. And unfortunately, this patient's tuberculosis eroded into the pulmonary artery. And when that happens, you are coughing up blood and the patient died. So this young boy died on the streets and nobody touched him for many days. He was lying on the streets. And this is when a group of small group of people came together that said, we can't let this happen. We can't let people die without dignity. We got to do something about it. The first thing they wanted to do and send this body back to, to the parents of, uh, of, this, of this young boy. So they collected some donations and it was $136 and some cents. Then they took this money and sent this body back to the East Coast. Then they were left with some, some dollars left behind. They said, we got to find some way of being able to prevent this from happening. And that's when these two tents were created. There was a garment manufacturer who donated some garments. There was a person that donated 10 acres of sun-soaked land that had oranges all around this. And that is this land, this land that you see here, the two tents that were erected, one was for patients and one was for caregivers. And there were nurses that sat in one of those tents and lived in one of those tents. And all they did was help people with nutrition, help people get up and around. They did not have any treatment for those tuberculosis, but they had the warmth and the care. And I think that care and that compassion and that that thought process of we got to let people even die with dignity or help them through the end of life was what was in these tents and still lives at City of Hope. And when tuberculosis stopped becoming a scourge, when streptomycin came in as an antibiotic, and the point was, what do we do now? Our job is more or less done. And that's next slide, please. That expansion from 1913, when those two tents were erected into creating a system across the country where we would not only think about tuberculosis, but think about any life-threatening disease. So in that 
slide that you see in 1920, all these patients were taken out of these small hut mates that were created. All of this was done through donation. In fact, till 1980s, City of Hope was a place where you would get free care. There was not even a mechanism of billing insurance companies. In fact, if somebody came, had ovarian cancer and came with their insurance card, we did not have a mechanism to do that because we were delivering all free care. So in that area between 1920 and 1980s, all of what we delivered was basically free care. And when in 1920s and 30s, streptomycin came about, we realized that either we closed down because our job is done, or we focus on the dignity and the care and new treatments that should be delivered and can be delivered in all life-threatening diseases. So we not only focused on tuberculosis, but we focused on pulmonary disease. Things like um, there, there was a unique disease called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. A lot of that research developed at City of Hope where you would get emphysema, even though you don't smoke, you would have these walls of the lung that would get broken down because you had a gene mutation and that would create very difficult difficulties in breathing. So life-threatening diseases and our expansion and our name got around the whole country. We used to have these small groups and on the top you will see the little helpers. These were small, similar to what you have today as Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. They would collect money, the March of the Dimes, uh, collect dimes, collect quarters across the whole country. In fact, some of the biggest fundraisers were not in California. They were in Tennessee and they were in the South and that helped us advance science. And that science focused now on cancers. You see that cobalt bomb, it was actually called the cobalt bomb because it created radiation. Radiation was just discovered as a treatment for cancer. And once it started uh, becoming more and more known, it was expensive to deliver radiation. And this mechanism of delivering the cobalt bomb was delivering radiation at as much smaller cost because people could not afford to get radiation. And this was an advancement that was made at City of Hope. In fact, the initial um, technology is still in, in the Beckman Research Institute, which is one of our research institutes. Next slide. It also attracted some of world's exceptional scientists, um, especially during the internment, the Jap Japanese internment, where a lot of the Japanese scientists and uh, and and the, the 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 people that came from Japan were shunned. City of Hope became an oasis for them. In fact, we attracted them. One of the earliest scientists, Susumu Uno, who is on your left top, that you see was one of the people who actually focused on what is called X chromosome inactivation. In fact, if you go into understanding the X chromosome, it is one of the, the most diverse chromosome. It can be only this big, or it can be three times its size. A lot of that science of how the X chromosome gets inactivated as we grow from a baby into an adult was all that science was developed here at, at City of Hope. Um, our, focus on nursing education and growing the nurses training was developed here at City of Hope. You will see that that fountain that used to be here in the center that is a sine qua non of City of Hope and the the statue that is on the on the middle top was developed by this uh, this young architect named uh, Robert Robert Rusin. Robert Rusin developed that and that whenever you see City of Hope, um, how you identify it is by that um, that statue. It, because of construction, it has gone into a storage, but it'll come back out. And when you see City of Hope, you'll see that fountain and that statue coming back to life. Um, growth with our national recognition through uh, celebrities and through the queen coming here was all... Um, a way to get City of Hope's unique science out. But what has been a transformational point for City of Hope is what you see on that top right graph. That gentleman with the handlebar mustache that you see is Dr. Artrix. Artrix was a scientist 
that came here and passed away last year here after 50 years of service to Sri Yafab. In fact, 52 years. In fact, when we had a 50 year celebration of his discoveries, one of the things that has transformed the world, the world of, of cancer and the world of diabetes is that genetic code that both Dr. Art Riggs and uh, Keiki Itakura developed. They developed a way of having a cell. In this case, it was an E. coli cell where you would insert the gene for insulin and the cell started making insulin when you put it in the right way and when you when you put a promoter next to it. And so you can create synthetic insulin and that insulin has to save the lives of millions and millions of people across the world, people who may have never heard of Syria call. That has been a, a technology that developed biotech. In fact, if you heard of a company called Genentech, Genentech is a company that actually got built by City of Hope and City of Hope and Genentech combined together to make insulin available for the common person, for the common person that was dealing with diabetes. Once Artridge did that, he moved from there to develop what is called monoclonal antibody. And that monoclonal antibody, today when you look at major drugs, drugs like Herceptin, Rituxin, uh, Bevacizumab, Avastin, drugs that are used in rheumatoid arthritis, drugs that are used in Crohn's disease, you might have heard of infliximab, you might have heard of anti-targeted uh, therapy drugs. All of them are developed by this recombinant technology that Dr. Art Riggs developed. So I think our impact is not just on the people that come through the doors here, the people that are in the Far East that are taking these drugs and their lives are extended and their lives are making better by that technology. But it also built, City of Hope got patent money from these technologies that actually allowed us to invest back into the science. And that science has been the foundation and the cornerstone of it. Next slide, please. So from that scientific underpinnings, we developed a grad school here where we are graduating close to 70 grad students every year. These are either in clinical fellowship programs or graduate programs where they get a PhD degree. We have uh, a PhD program here. We also have, at that time, around 98, got the NCI designation of a comprehensive cancer center. That means that we have all the elements of science, elements of clinical care, but also elements of how we benefit the communities around us, how we benefit the people who may not have access to good care, indigent population. We also developed a new hospital around 2005, and uh, that hospital is called the Halford Hospital. It's now close to 20 years old, and we became much more prominent around that time, getting into the top 10, top 20 of US World News Report. What you will realize also that that science that I talked about briefly advanced into developing new treatments. We were the ones to develop the HPV vaccine that you see around. We developed vaccines around a disease called CMV, cytomegalovirus, because we were now getting into becoming a very prominent bone marrow transplant place. And when you do a bone marrow transplant, you see that you kill all the patients own cells because amongst them are the cancer cells. So when you wipe out all the cancer, well, all the cells, you realize these unique bacteria, these unique viruses will come and they will, uh, they, they can kill a patient. And those vaccines that were developed against cytomegalovirus were developed here at CDFO because we were on the cutting edge of the technology. We also developed a COVID vaccine that actually is in production, is in, is in use now and is used for those patients that have immunocompromised status and has two targets, a target, which is, you know, as the spike protein, but also a core top target that is the nucleocapsid that, that can help um, prevent those infections in these immunocompromised patients. Next one. So as we grow in this, in this expansion, our responsibility of not only having this expansion in Duarte, but expanding outside became very important. 
because today only about 10 to 15 percent of care is delivered about these big academic institutions city of Hope being one of them so we developed this network and through that expansion we are now the largest bone marrow transplant center in the country for the last two years in fact we just completed our 15,000 bone marrow transplant a couple of years back, and that bone marrow transplantation is now being done in Phoenix, and it was already done in Chicago and expanding to Atlanta as well. We also developed an amazing clinical and research structure where some of the largest CERN, uh, Center for Regenerative Medicine grants are being, uh, being given to City of Hope, and we have the largest on the largest NIH grant expansion in the last 10 years. Next slide. So let me take a couple of minutes on this slide and then hand, um, hand it back over to, uh, to Dan. The expansion into Orange County, and this is one of the things that I uh, think is unique about City of Hope, is our ability to grow and grow quickly. The decision to put in a billion dollars into our expansion into Orange County and grow in other states, those decisions were made at such a speed that there is no organization in this country that is attached to a big university center can move that quickly. Our ability to move quickly and understand the needs of, uh, of a community and then take our uniqueness and develop in the community, we can do that quickly. We are one of three freestanding cancer centers in this country. And that is how this, this combination with what was CTCA makes sense. Because the focus, the ability to grow in a certain area and do that quickly, because for patients, wait is a four letter word. And we can't wait for them to get that care that we know will help them and cure them. And that's where when you heard Dan talk about Atlanta and Phoenix and Chicago and our expansion into Tegen, which is a research institute in, in Phoenix that we bought about six years back, has been the engine that has helped us deliver on that promise that we made to those people that are 110 years back and that continues to be our ground. Can we move to the next slide? I think I will stop here and, and um, ask Dan and Jen to see whether we can take any questions. Yeah, Dr. Thank Trisal, you, Dr. I have Trisal. a... Go ahead, Jen. Nope, I was just going to say thank you as well. <laughs> go ahead, Dan. No, I was going to I was going to go to the questions that I know were submitted by um, a number of our cancer fighters across the country. Um, the first one is for you, Dr. Trisal, and, and the question is, um, you know, how is City of Hope similar to what was CTCA and, and how might it be different? I think when you look at organizations, there are three, four things that come to my mind. One is the building, which is probably in my mind the least important part of, of the, the care. We got to have great infrastructure to be able to deliver that care. But it is, what are you doing? What is it that is your core value? And who are the people that are delivering that care? When I have visited Phoenix, Atlanta, Chicago, I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, in, in, it's in my heart more than anything else. When I close my eyes and when I talk to people and I listen to people that are in these sites, I can't tell whether I am in Duarte, I'm in Orange County, or I am in Atlanta, or I am in Chicago, or I am in Phoenix. I, I think the people that are dedicated to the cause, the focus on cancer and the need to go deeper rather than wider is the similarity and that is the sameness between what was in Phoenix, Atlanta, Chicago, what was in Duarte and what is as a unit combined together. Uh, there are differences that, that we have. I uh, talked about the science that we have developed and that science has been um, something that at Duarte has been very unique. There are not many organizations that can replicate that. And when we take that science and we take the unique way of delivering care in these three sites and we combine them, 
it is not just a sum of its parts. It, it multiplies. It's not just an addition. It becomes a multiplication of what we can do here. Thank you, Dr. Prasal. Okay, Dan, I have a question for you. Um, okay. You know, I, we have amazing cancer fighters ambassadors in our Cancer Fighters Care Net program. And one of the questions is, I am an ambassador often speaking with patients considering treatment at City of Hope. Can you please share your thoughts and insights on how ambassadors can better explain City of Hope and encourage patients and caregivers to consider treatment? Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, thanks for the question. Um, you know, first and foremost, I'd say, look, City of Hope is is dedicated and committed to making a difference in in the lives of uh, people who are facing cancer, diabetes, and other other life threatening illnesses. Um, I think I'd share with them that we 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 are committed to expanding this this um, care for these conditions across the country, um, with our locations in California, Arizona, Illinois, and Georgia. Um, and, and I would make mention, just like Dr. Trasal said, of of our um, twelve thousand employees who, you know, whether you're sitting in 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 Chicago or I've had the same experience visiting. Uh, the Duarte campus uh, as well, where you could close your eyes and you could think you're you're at the you're at CTCA or what was CTCA. Um, we're united um, in that sense and, and in the desire to find cures and save lives. Um, I might also uh, remark a bit about the um, the incredible clinical reputation um, that City of Hope has um, related to clinical research and medical breakthroughs. Um, you know, being part of the group of 54 National Cancer uh, Institute designated comprehensive cancer centers uh, is, is one of those. Uh, being in the top 10 of, of cancer centers within uh, U.S. News and World Report uh, would be another. Um, you know, I would I would also mention perhaps that um, we're a founding mem member of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, reflecting our national leadership in advancing research and treatment um, for uh, complex and rare and aggressive forms of cancer. Um, and then lastly, I might say, you know, City of Hope is different because cancer care is different. Um, and because we believe every patient deserves access to that leading edge treatment and care regardless of their circumstances um, and or where they're from. And, and I'd say that that would probably be the, the third thing I would think about um, differentiating ourselves from, from maybe other other providers in the market. Thanks, Dan. Dr. Trussell, we have another question for you. Um, a a Cancer Fighters member is asking, when I started at CTCA, I had access to services that treated my whole body, not just my cancer. Will I have access to services like massage therapy and acupuncture again? So this is where, um, when I talk about learning from each other, and this is one of those points where what CTCA used to do is now becoming so well understood that there are many other organizations that are quote unquote copying it. Um, as Dan mentioned, cancer care is different. If you have a person that has to deal with cardiac disease, babies, uh, trauma, um, bone fractures, all of those things. You can't create that workforce. And the workforce here, the people who are taking care of these, these patients, cancer becomes a visceral disease. And for that, the prehab, the ability to understand the, the psychosocial component of that, the ability to have alternative therapies like massage or, or pet therapy or acupuncture become a critical component. It is not an also have, it become a critical component. And while Duarte was, was doing this in a manner that was individual, I think what the erstwhile CTCA has taught us is that, that it becomes an integral component of what a full package should be. To that effect, you might have heard that we recently got a hundred million dollar grant to combine some of these alternative therapies, the Eastern medicine, the Western medicine, the impact of yoga, the impact of, 
of being able to do hypnosis, the impact of pet therapy, the impact of, uh, uh, of, of, um, of any alternate therapy that helps with mind, body, and the family. And that has become a core component of, we have an institute now that uh, is an institute of alternative therapies. And I think this is one place where um, the past CPCA was ahead of most of these organizations. And we, as a combined city of hope, are now trailblazers in this, pioneers in this. And there are many other organizations that are coming to us and saying, how did you do this? How do you do this now? And what is the future of this? And so I, I'm proud to say that we are combined in this and have helped each other get better. Thank you, Dr. Trasal. I'm gonna stay with you for one more question. Um, the question is, is the mother's standard of care still the same? I think when I think of mother's standard of care, which was a new terminology for me when uh, when CDCA and city became City of Hope, I think of it as the mother's standard of care being a yardstick of how would you treat your mom? How would you treat your family? How would you treat your child? How would you treat somebody you love? And that is actually in the walls of, of City of Hope, no matter where it is. So whether you call it mother's standard of care, which I think is a very, very apt terminology, or you call it the hope experience, or you call it the city of hope way, there is that secret sauce that runs through the organization. That is the culture of the place. How do you treat each other? And it's actually not just patients. How do you treat each other as human beings? How do you treat each other as partners in this? And how do you treat somebody who is now going to not just, you don't have a therapy for them. You may not have a treatment. How do you treat them? I have heard many times, Jen, that when we have patients coming for a clinical trial here, and, and this is the comment that is sad, that they say that a different institution, uh, they were on a clinical trial and they were uh, well liked, they had all the resources as soon as they fell off the clinical trial because either they didn't respond or they had um, exhausted the clinical trial. It was as if that organization did not care about you, as if you didn't exist. And that that mother's standard of care is not just when therapies end. It is not just when you don't have anything to offer from a clinical perspective. That is when the patient needs you the most. And that I think is the essence of what cancer care is all about. Thank you. Dan, we have one for you. The question is, obviously these are our cancer fighters, but will we continue to have access to the cancer fighters program? Jen, you gave me the easy one. Uh, short answer, <laughs> yes. Uh, cancer fighters is gonna, uh, is absolutely going to remain uh, an important program for us that taps into the experience and knowledge and inspiration of our more than 40,000 cancer patients and caregivers across the country who are part of, uh, who are part of the cancer fighters. Um, in addition, it enables us as City of Hope really to learn and partner with you all to, to know how we can do better, how we can improve, and, and where we should really be focused. Um, you know, we are we are very excited about the future of cancer fighters and the opportunities ahead of us um, as we look to support uh, our, our, our growing organization and the patients who need our help. Thanks, Dan. All right, Dr. Drusel, we're going to end with you. One last question. As a cancer patient, I have grown to have a strong relationship with my care team and my medical oncologist and place a lot of trust in my care team. Should I expect to see any changes in my care team now that CTCA is part of City of Hope? I, I was feeling left out, Jen, for not getting the easy <laughs> You gave Dan the easy question, but I think this is easier. There's no reason anything would change. I'll tell you what will change. That we will give collective intelligence of hundreds of years of experience around the table where a doctor that is already taking care of the patient is able to pick the brain of the world specialist, whether that is in Duarte or Chicago or any place. So what we have done is created one unique medical record. 
So uh, as you know, that we implemented EPIC in all our sites. So we have one electronic health record where the world's expert, no matter where they are, can opine and can help tweak so that you have, yeah. the patient has the best chance of not just survival, but also the best chance of decreasing toxicity, the best chance of being able to avoid unnecessary therapy, best chance of getting home quicker. So the doctor won't change, the care team won't change, the approach and the way we deliver care won't change, but the, the thought process and the idea of what is the best treatment will only get better. Thank you. Thank you both. On behalf of all of our Cancer Fighters members, I know I um, am proud to be part of City of Hope, um, not only as an employee, but as a patient. And this has just inspired me and connected me even more to City of Hope. Before we sign off, any final words for our Cancer Fighters members? I, I would take a moment to thank them. A lot of the volunteers that are across the system um, they do this work out of the generosity of their heart. Uh, they give the, the most precious commodity, which is their time to help others. I don't think there's anything more uh, human quality. I want to thank them for doing what they do every day and helping us to be able to provide that care. I would love to spend more time with them, understand more how we can uh, improve better and that communication. I want this this moment to be a moment where we open the doors and I become available for future comments. Anything that comes through, that communication is our strength. And, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you both so much.